Hey everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Ashokan Hello. I'm Rachel Rosen, and I'll be your host for today. Uh, here at the Ashokan Center, uh, where the New York Catskill Mountains meets the Hudson River, we welcome school groups uh, for outdoor education, nature, living history programs for over 50 years. We've also hosted traditional music and dance camps for adults and families for over 40 years. Um, it's a joyful assortment of weddings, retreats, and community events here on our beautiful 385 acres. Right now, we can't gather in person, so we're so grateful to be connecting with all of you online, and you are sharing a piece of Ashokan today, so thanks for tuning in. Uh, spring is a great time to look for wildlife traces, and since we haven't had many people here on campus, we have seen critters everywhere. Uh, so today we're going to be joining one of our educators, Dennis Grant, while he explores the 385 acres and becomes a wildlife detective. Uh, Dennis knows that when you're looking for evidence, even the smallest discovery can lead to something really big. Um, so today we have some really great resources for you. If you look at the buttons below, the first one you'll see is the National Wildlife Federation. They have tons of great games and videos and also a free online version of the longest running children's nature magazine, Ranger Rick. So make sure to check that out. You can also check out the Wildlife Conservation Society. They help protect, protect wildlife all over the world and they can tell you how you can help with, with that. Uh, the next link we have for you is from the DEC. This link will help you actually become a wildlife detective and will give you tips and really great locations on how you can enhance your chances to see wildlife. And finally, if you're interested in becoming a citizen scientist, uh, you can help by collecting and reporting data about wildlife that you actually see, and the DEC will, will use that in their uh, data. Uh, we have something also new this week. We'd love to hear from you about suggestions and feedback about how you've been enjoying Ashokan Hello. So if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, you'll see a little form you can fill out and submit. This week, we'd also love to see some animal tracks and traces that you might have in your home. So if you have a shark's tooth that maybe you found at the beach or a really strange footprint that you have in your backyard in the mud, snap a picture and put it on there for us. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, I do have some shout outs today uh, for some folks that we know are watching. Uh, some students from PS158, Deborah and all the Vale Farm students out there. Of course, Chef Bill, who turns in, tunes in every week. Gemma, Zoe, and students from the Village School. So we're thrilled to have you all here today. Um, without further ado, here is Dennis in the field. Thank you, Rachel. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Dennis, and today we are going to be discovering and investigating the wildlife species that live here at the Ashokan Center. Together with all of you and my friend Lucas, we are going to become wildlife detectives as we visit the various habitats that exist here to figure out what species we live with. Before we get started, though, I want to talk a little bit about what evidence we're looking for. So when I refer to wildlife, I'm going to be referring to the animals. Now, animal species fit into one of two categories. They're either going to be invertebrates, those animals without a backbone, so things like insects, worms, arachnids, etc. by far the more diverse group of animals. And then you have vertebrates, so things like fish, reptiles, amphibians, birds, and mammals. Now, when we talk about traces, traces are going to be those things that give us an indication that an animal is present in the area. So, things like scat. Scat is animal poop. If an animal's uh, leaving scat around in a habitat, that means it's probably hanging out there, right? Things like bite marks in leaves or in trees or various other objects would give us an indication that something's been eating there. A feather left on the ground would tell us that a bird species is in the area. A cavity in a tree or maybe a burrow in the ground would tell us that an animal is living in that tree or underground there. Tracks are gonna be those like paw prints and footprints that we see of animals that are left behind. The best places to look for those are going to be in like mud and snow where a good impression is created so you can see all the details. Here I have a typical canine track so you'll see that classic paw print pattern with some claws coming out the digits. 
underneath it is a feline track. You'll notice that there are no claws coming out the digits. That's because felines are able to retract their claws when they're walking. So you won't see those claws in their prints. Over here, I have two examples of generalized bird prints. So up top, we have a webbed foot. That would indicate that that bird is an aquatic dwelling species. It likes to hang out in water. Underneath it might be a bird that likes to hang out in trees or on the ground more often. Then over here, you might notice some of these tracks. So here we have a deer track. That's a classic track, especially here in the Northeast, you'll see a lot of that. Underneath it is a raccoon track. So they have tracks that kind of look like our hands. That's because it is essential for them to be able to feel out uh, their environment because they come out at night to forage for food. So keeping all of that in mind, we, we're going to go and journey out. But before we do that, I want to make a couple quick notes. We need to be observant. So we're going to be using basically all of our senses. So we're going to be looking, we're going to be listening, maybe even smelling, probably not tasting, especially if we're going to find scat. I wouldn't recommend doing that. And then the other thing I want to mention is that we need to be respectful. We are going into the homes of other animals. So we want to make sure that we're leaving no trace that we were there. All right. So without further ado, let's get started. Wow. Look at what we have here. It looks like the beginnings of a bird's nest. So I say the beginnings of a bird nest because it doesn't look completely constructed. This makes sense though, given the season that we're in. So we're in spring. A lot of times birds are gonna be migrating back in the spring from where they wintered. So they're gonna be coming back and building nests and breeding to lay their eggs in these nests, right? This one looks like it was abandoned and they moved to a different location. So they probably didn't lay eggs in it. They just decided that they were gonna build their nest somewhere else. We'll leave that here. That's really cool and really promising um, sign that we might see some more evidence around. Just like that. Looks like we have a bird feather. Anyone know what species this is? Now, before I give it away, I wanna talk a little bit about feathers. So birds have more puffy feathers that are their down feathers that help insulate their body so it keeps them warm. Then they have flight feathers that are on the outside that provide more structure. So this feather, you can see the central rachis and then barbs that come out on the side. And then there's little tiny barbules that help keep the feather's shape, almost acting like Velcro. Another cool thing about this feather in particular is that it's blue. There are virtually no animals in the animal kingdom that produce a true blue pigment. That means that the blue that you're seeing is the result of the light reflecting off the structures within the feather. Pretty cool. So if you said that this was a blue jay feather, I'd say that you're right. It looks actually to be uh, the tail feather of a blue jay, given the coloration of this blue and this white tip. It's really cool. Again, we are going to leave no trace, so I'm gonna put this back where we found it. Now, if you look, Right up there in that tree, you'll see not a birdhouse, but a bat box. So bats are a really cool species that we have here at the Ashokan Center. They mainly come out at night to forage, so they're nocturnal. Bats are really cool groups of animals. They have been around on this earth for more than 50 million years. If you think of a diet that an animal can have, there's probably a bat that has it from anything from fruit-eating bats, so frugivorous bats, insectivorous bats that eat insects, piscivorous bats that eat fish, and you even have those ones that feed on blood. They're really cool species, and they need a lot of our help right now because there is something called white nose syndrome that comes from a invasive species of fungus. So that's causing a lot of bats to decline here, especially in the Northeast of the United States. And bats are really important for a lot of different reasons, from pollination to fertilization. So if you see a bat around, it's a really good sign. All right, so we're gonna keep on going from here. We'll see what else we can find.
Well, looks like we made it out to the Ashokan Center pastures. This is one of my favorite areas on campus to look for wildlife tracks and traces. Got a nice wide open space with a good amount of trees and some water. Tracks a lot of wildlife. Also, there's a lot of mud and mud makes for really good substrate to look for tracks in. So let's see what we can discover. Well, would you look at that? Like I was saying, over in this mud, it creates really good impressions of tracks. Right here, it looks like we have some sort of bird print. You can tell because it has these three toes extending out from the foot, giving me an indication that this is some type of bird. Now, another thing you want to look for when determining species is the size and maybe some other characteristics. So, I can also see that there is a faint impression of webbing between the toes here. That gives me the knowledge that this is some type of bird that likes to hang out in the water. And given the size and where we are in the world, I would say that this is probably some sort of Canada geese tracks here. Now, I have further evidence to support that point. Right over here, make sure I don't step on it. Looks like we have some bird droppings. Now, these droppings don't smell giving me the indication that this is something that probably has an herbivorous diet or something that eats vegetation. And I know that Canada geese are herbivorous and eat a lot of vegetation. So their droppings are not gonna give off a really strong odor, which is good for me right now because of how close I am to it. Another thing about Canada geese is that, like I was saying with the webbed feet, they like to be near water. So let's investigate this a little bit further let's keep going and see if we can find actual evidence visual confirmation that they are around oh, oh. if you look right over there looks like i just confirmed my suspicions we have a pair of Canada geese with their three little chicks foraging over there in the vegetation right by the Ashokan Center Pond. Now, so that we don't disturb them but we can get a closer look at the pond and see what else is over there, we're going to try to find a safer way around keeping our distance and respecting wildlife because those parents are going to be very protective over their young. Even though they are precocial and can do things on their own, those parents are gonna make sure they defend their chicks. So we're gonna find a safer way around. In the meantime, enjoy some footage of those chicks. So we made it safely around the pond without disturbing our geese over there. So geese like to breed like many birds in the spring. So they come up here, back up from their migration. They vary in terms of how far they will migrate in the winter to warmer weather, um, depending on how warm it is where they start out. They came back up here, they've bred, they've hatched their chicks. What they'll usually do is they'll lay their eggs in a large um, sort of open nest. They'll be on like rocks like you see on the pond like that, or maybe some sort of muskrat mound that's made some sort of higher elevation space but it's nice to see that they're doing well right now um, it's a treat to be able to watch them grow they've grown quite a bit actually since we first saw them um, earlier on in the season so now that we're at the pond though you've already seen some of the macro invertebrates with Allie that live here we're actually you know here at a great time the springtime is when a lot of life comes up, not just chicks for birds, but you also see a lot of things kind of start to wake up. So if you look over at that log, actually, we have a painted turtle sitting right over there basking in the warmth of the light. So painted turtles, much like many other turtles, will overwinter under the ice. They don't actually hibernate. They slow down quite a bit, but they're able to survive in there they're able to actually take up oxygen um, through a very various means in the water, including actually their cloaca, which is their hind end. But you'll also see snakes basking, um, other turtles bask. Basking means that you're 
kind of taking in the sunlight, that's because they're ectotherms. So unlike us, we're endotherms. We produce our own body heat within us, like birds do. Uh, turtles and reptilians are ectotherms. They're getting their heat from the external environment. So they come up uh, out of the water to kind of warm up. And actually, we have some pretty interesting evidence of turtles that live around here. So right here, if you can see, I have a piece of the plastron of a turtle. So the plastron is the ventral or the belly side of the shell. Um, so one common misconception that a lot of people have about turtles is that they can come out of their shells. They can't actually do that. The, the shell itself is part of their skeleton. Um, and you can see that even more clearly in this big snapping turtle shell that we have here. You can see that the rib cage and the spinal um, column is attached to the top of the shell called the carapace. Um, so they can't actually get out of their shell. But what they can do, and what some of them do, is close up really tight so they can kind of hinge themselves closed. They can withdraw their head and their limbs. But snapping turtles, uh, as you can see, have this very sort of small plastron here. They're not going to be able to really hide themselves too much, which is a big part of why they can be so aggressive, because um, they don't have much to defend themselves with their shell, unlike other turtles do, that can close up. So a lot of their defense mechanism is to get aggressive and start biting at whatever it is that may be trying to attack them. On that note, you will see that other animals will associate with uh, snapping turtles in a symbiotic relationship. One of those notable ones is like the painted turtle over there. You'll often see that small little painted turtle near these big old snapping turtles. And you would think, well, the snapping turtle could easily take down the painted turtle. Why would it do that? Well, what the painted turtle actually does for the snapping turtle is it will eat the leeches and algae that grow on a snapping turtle. And in turn, um, it gets those nutrients and the snapping turtle benefits by having those parasites removed. So it's a mutualistic relationship in which both parties are benefiting from that symbiosis, which is really neat. Other things you'll see by the pond, especially as it gets warmer, uh, on top of the various insects and butterflies that we have roaming around, you'll hear frogs a lot of times. Allie did a great piece on spring peepers that you should check out. Um, we were recently hearing some green frogs over here by the pond. So lots of life to come with spring, especially near the water. So if you have any water near you, you should definitely go and check it out. But we're, uh, we're gonna go on our way to another area of campus and see what else we have. So we decided to come down to our lower campus area here. It's one of my favorite spots to just sit down and listen and watch wildlife. Lots of water around here, lots of trees, plenty of great habitat to support a wide diversity of wildlife. You might be able to even hear some of the geese and then some cardinals in the background, plenty of red-winged blackbirds, lots of things going on here. So I'm pretty excited to see what we can find. So why don't you all follow me and we'll explore a little bit. Oh man, do you see that? this. Well, it looks like we have some sort of trace of an animal. Anybody know what that is? Well, if you said beaver, I think you're 100% right. Here at the Ashokan Center, we like to call this bevidence. Now, beavers do this to trees because their diet is herbivorous, so they're eating plants. They like to eat the bark and cambium of trees, and then sometimes they will make dams from what they cut down, right? So they're a really important ecological species. I think we should keep exploring a little bit further to see if there's any more evidence of them so we can talk about them a little bit further. Here we are on the Wiggly Bridge and I see some evidence. That's right, there's beaver evidence right there. It looks like there's a lodge. Beavers are really cool animals. They are the second largest rodent in the world and they have these ever-growing incisors so they grow throughout their lifetime. They have this orange pigment because of the iron that's infused in them. This allows them to gnaw on really big trees and take them down. Beavers are herbivorous. They like to feed on bark and cambium of trees and then other vegetation. So you may see 
there are markings on certain trees around. Uh, but another thing that's really cool about them is that they're ecosystem engineers, meaning they have the power to alter the environment that they're in significantly. This makes them also keystone species, meaning that they're a species that has a greater impact on the environment than a lot of other species. So taking them out would cause a detrimental effect on the environment. This is because when they dam up a body of water, they are flooding the area behind it, allowing for more vegetation to grow, which creates habitat for insects, creates habitat for birds, and can also help fish that are in the area. This is beneficial for them too because they eat the vegetation and it allows them to more easily access that vegetation by swimming to it. Really cool, I think it's neat, but we'll keep going. Hey y'all, so now we are moving on from our more aquatic habitats at the Ashokan Center to a forest habitat. There's plenty of biodiversity uh, that comes along with different ecosystems. In a forest, for example, you'll find species living in trees, up them in cavities, living in burrows on the ground, or living in logs and things like that. So I'm sure there will be plenty of evidence that we can find if we look close enough and if we're quiet so we can listen for those clues. So let's head on over this way. like we have something right here. So if you look closely, it looks like a burrow in the bottom of this tree. This is likely the home of a chipmunk. So chipmunks will scurry about the forest. I've been hearing them scurrying. I've been hearing them squeaking about. Um, there are a number of different uh, living things that live within trees. I've even seen some snakes living in trees. So chipmunks, this is a really cool sign that they're around here. We'll keep moving though, because I know there's more life than just chipmunks in here. Just like that. Looks like we have some deer scat. So we've seen deer around here too. There's plenty of deer at the Ashokan Center. Um, this is just one sign that we know that they've been around hanging in this forest here. So pretty cool. Let's keep going. So I feel like there's even more biodiversity to be had. Oh, this is pretty neat. Look at that. Does anyone know what that is? Well, if you said scat, that's a good guess. Not quite scat. I'm going to pick it up and show y'all. So this is actually really cool. This is an owl pellet. Owls are those nocturnal birds of prey, so they come out at night. An owl pellet is different from bird droppings. Now, owls do produce bird droppings, but the pellet itself is the regurgitated, indigestible material that an owl takes from its prey. So those are like the bones and the fur and the hair, maybe feathers from those small mammals and birds that an owl is ingesting. And you know what? I think we have a nice tree for y'all because we have a dissected one back at the Asopus Lodge. So let's go check it out. at our outdoor science lab. In front of me, I have a partially dissected owl pellet that Lucas and I have already gone through a little bit to kind of show you what you can find within an owl pellet. So if you wanna come over here and take a look at what we found, this is actually one where I can see a skull poking out and they're really easy to take apart because it's really just fur and bones. It's that undigested material that the owls are regurgitating. So if you look real close, you can see that this incisor on this skull has like an orangish yellowish pigment to it. That tells me that this is some sort of rodent skull. So if you look over here, we have this handy key that tells us what types of bones belong to which type of animal. And overwhelmingly, most of the bones that we found in this owl pellet belong to rodents. So we found things like skulls, jaws, forelimb bones, hyaline bones. We found some ribs too and some pelvic bones. Um, that tells us that the owl that produced this pellet was primarily eating rodents. That also has some greater ecological significance in telling us what species are in the area. So not only do we have owls, we have rodents as well because that's what they're eating. So it's pretty cool to not only find traces, but investigate them a little bit further and become, you know, scientists and discover what else is in the area based on what you find. Now we're back here at the Asopus Lodge to wrap up our wildlife expedition. We took our journey 
through the Ashokan campus during the daytime, which means we're limited to really seeing diurnal animals, those animals that are active during the day. There are also animals that are crepuscular, so those animals that are most active at dawn and dusk, and then nocturnal animals, which are most active at, you guessed it, at nighttime. So we have some really cool specimen here that I can show you to give a closer look at those animals that we didn't get to see. So right here in front of me, I have a red fox. So red foxes are one of my personal favorite animals, and they are very much generalist. They are widespread throughout North America. They have a very generalist diet. They will eat a lot of the different things, um, from small rodents to berries and things like that. So they eat meat and vegetation, which makes them omnivorous, right? We have herbivores, which eat only vegetation and plants, and then we have carnivores that only eat meat. So being omnivorous, it is beneficial to have all four types of teeth well developed. So the four types of teeth being incisors, those ones in front, then you have larger canines, then premolars and molars. So these canines are going to be a lot more pronounced in omnivores and carnivores that are tearing through meat, right? Unlike something like a white-tailed deer, which is an herbivore. So they actually do not have any sort of canine teeth. They just have these molars and then incisors. This is the lower jaw of one of those white-tailed deer. So dentition, or the dental pattern that an animal has, can tell you a lot about its diet. So moving on from our red fox, we have the beaver. Beaver, keystone species, ecological engineer, really cool. You don't often get to see them up close like this. They're gonna be one of those ones where the best chance you have to see them is gonna be right before uh, the sun goes down or right as the sun is rising in the morning. So they have a really cool system of adaptations. Their fur is actually water repellent. They're really strong swimmers in part because of their webbed hind feet and then this paddle-like tail. The tail also stores fat and can help them in thermal regulation. So really cool animals, really well adapted to their aquatic or semi-aquatic uh, lifestyle. Then we have the raccoon. So raccoon, another one of those omnivores, it will eat, as you may know, uh, just about anything. Now in the wild, naturally, they go down to forage near wetlands and in the rivers and stuff like that to pick up like small macroinvertebrates, but they'll also eat some vegetation. Um, and we mentioned earlier that they have these paws that kind of look like hands, right? Their tactile senses are really important to them because they're nocturnal, they're foraging at night. So they rely on that tactile sensory to feel out where their food is. So another really cool animal. And then last but certainly not least, we have in general, bats. This happens to be an eastern pipistrelle. So bats are really cool, but also really misunderstood species. So they're not birds. They evolve flight separately. They have basically a wing that comes from their hand. So this membrane here is called the patagium. They have that, and that helps them to fly. And you can see that they have their digits actually going across there to hold up that membrane. That's gonna assist in their flying. Bats were first flyers and then they evolved something special called echolocation. So they're nocturnal and part of uh, being nocturnal is not being able to see too well. It's a misconception that bats are blind. They're not actually blind, um, but it is harder to see at night. So they use echolocation, meaning they emit a sound and then bring it back in um, and listen for it to get the detection and get a visualization of their environment to catch prey, right? So things like insects, and they can maneuver really well. So if you look by the ear really close, they have what's called a tragus that helps to direct that sound into their ear so that they're able to navigate at night. So really cool animals, um, one of our more important uh, groups of animals in the world. But yeah, I mean, there are so many countless other species that I could go over and talk about. And believe me, I could talk for days about wildlife. I'm so passionate about it. So I hope you have some of that passion in you too. And maybe this will help you go out and look for your favorite animals. You know, 
it's important though, you always have to keep in mind, be observant and be respectful, right? So good luck to you if you go out and try to find wildlife. I highly encourage it. Believe me, the signs are everywhere. So thanks for joining us. Back to you, Rachel. Wow, Dennis, that was awesome. I never knew that beavers were so important to their ecosystem. Uh, I learned a lot and I hope that you all did as well. Uh, tune in next week when we are joined by Del Orleski to discover wild edibles and medicinal plants on the Ashokan campus. Uh, now I will leave you with a song about animals from Amy Helm and her son Lee Collins. It was recorded just for you and it's called Little Buddy Rinktum. So enjoy and we'll see you next week. Hi everybody, my name's Amy and this is Lee. And we're gonna play a song for you. This is a song that my dad taught to me. He learned this when he was a little boy. And this is a song about a whole bunch of different animals. This is called Little Buddy Rinktum. There's a spider, there's a snake, there's a flea, and there's a lot of fun things that happen in the song. Ready? Go ahead, Lee. One, two, three. Mr. Spider went to town, little buddy rinktum time yo. Brought with him the wedding gown, little buddy rinktum time yo. Captain Kiro, Simon Nero, seven inch a bob and a little buddy rinktum a rinktum a rinktum a little buddy rinktum time yo. In came Mr. Flea, little buddy rinktum time yo. Brought his fiddle upon his knee, little buddy rinktum time yo. Captain Kiro, Simon Nero, seven inch a bob and a little buddy rinktum. Seven inch a bob and a little battery, a ring, a ring, a little battery, a time yo.